Well, thank you for staying until the last panel. Um, we are final, final panelists up before the closing, so hopefully we can keep this engaging. Um, I have an amazing group here today. We're going to be talking about how and if public policy sparks innovation. Um, so I really want to start by having the panelists introduce themselves. We'll, we'll do the fun fact also. Or we'll try to keep this engaging. Um, I'm Jessica Olson. I'm the Managing Director of Programs and Partnerships at Manifest Medics. We're the largest non-for-profit health information exchange in California. And my fun fact is I'm a true crime aficionado. I love true crime podcasts. So if any of you guys want to geek out on true crime after this, uh, please just find me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Jared Seehofer. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Enzyme. Uh, we automate the regulatory compliance and submission process for life science companies, those making uh, medical devices, drugs, diagnostics. So the uh, policy that I'll be speaking about today is that with respect to FDA. Uh, we're also a proud Rock Health portfolio member. Uh, and my fun fact is that in my not so copious uh, free time from being a founder, I'm an amateur winemaker. So uh, come find me for bottles if you're in the San Francisco area, I guess. <laughs> Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Tom Castles. I am the Chief Strategy Officer for CareC2, which is a uh, subsidiary of Lidos. Uh, Lidos is a science and technology firm um, working in the federal government space and uh, the commercial space. Uh, I uh, work with my team on building digital applications uh, to ostensibly take friction out of the working lives of clinicians uh, and friction out of the experience of using health benefits for um, people like you and I walking around. Um, my fun fact, just because it's late in the day, um, I will give an embarrassing one. Um, I am, in fact, the uh, only elected member of the lower house of parliament uh, in a micronation called Calandia. Um, <laughs> Calandia was um, first incorporated uh, last year by my 10-year-old Colin. Um, <laughs> I'm in the lower house, uh, and I serve uh, the upper house, which uh, consists of one elephant, three teddy bears, um, and uh, one monkey. <laughs> I don't even know how to follow that. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, my name is Adamika Arthur, and I run a nonprofit called Health Tech for Medicaid. Health Tech for Medicaid is a market enabler. We um, exist to kind of bring payers, providers, policymakers, and entrepreneurs together to scale and innovate in the Medicaid space. Um, and my fun fact um, is that I, am in, I play weekly in an over 40 uh, soccer league. So, woo, awesome. Yes. Okay, so uh, let's kick off. I'm gonna set a little bit of context. Um, 2019 has been a swirl of federal policy and public policy that affects public health and, and healthcare. Um, I am here to see if it sparks innovation with you guys. Um, so I really wanna set the stage with a question to all of the panelists. You know, the Affordable Care Act was really a point of time where, um, you know, providers were incentivized to use electronic medical records, right? So a whole bunch of business came out of that. Um, new EHR companies and new ways to use systems. What is the public policy that is going to drive that sort of change? And what are you guys following? What are you guys excited about? Sorry, Chair. So with respect to the ACA? No, current public policy. <laughs> oh, OK. So uh, we would need wine if it was respect to the ACA. <laughs> yeah, I think we would need everyone to loosen up a little bit. <laughs> uh, um, so the cur current 
uh, policy shift around FDA. First of all, the thing to know about policy in the FDA is that there's a lot happening in a very short amount of time, which is um, really good for the industry. There's a lot of opportunity, but then it's also you know kind of very hard to keep up with. Um, I would say, for you know, particular for this audience, uh, the thing that's most uh, pertinent currently is how FDA is thinking around software. Um, most of these, you know, what we would consider digital health term uh, tools are going to be regulated as, as software medical devices. That sounds a little strange, but that's actually how they get regulated. And it, with respect to that, there are there are two trends of note. Um, First off, the pre-certification program, I won't really belabor that. I'm sure many in the audience have heard of that before. But bottom line, allowing companies to release software on a, on a relatively normal cadence without having to get marketing approval for each successive version. Uh, and then the second thing, which is a little bit more under the radar, is uh, the FDA's emerging framework around machine learning and uh, other artificial intelligence tools. Uh, right now, if you're a, a company, you have this like great ML tool. Maybe you're trying to do machine vision on some sort of uh, radiological image. You essentially have to freeze your product when you release it. So it can't actually evolve and, and get smarter in the field. And that's kind of a constraint. Thankfully, uh, FDA is working on a way to set ground rules for which, by which the uh, algorithm can learn. I think that's going to really unlock a lot uh, in 2020. Tom? Sure. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of a follow the money guy. Uh, so I think a lot of the policy uh, going on right now with respect to uh, payment rules in Medicare Part A, B, C, D, uh, maybe E, uh, that are freeing up uh, opportunities for paying for supplemental benefits in Medicare Advantage, uh, freeing up uh, funds for remote patient monitoring mm -hmm. in the Medicare program, um, and really anything that pays for something that isn't a hospital stay. No offense to hospital administrators. Um, that, I think, is going to make a big difference. Um, uh, and I, I also feel like, uh, and this is uh, uh, kind of building on what you're talking about with respect to um, what HHS is going to do with, uh, when, when it comes to kind of the bigger picture uh, related to um, uh, not just data blocking, but um, population health level uh, data sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, there isn't a single health system or health plan that has um, anything but dirty, incomplete data. Um, if we actually want uh, IoT and AI to mean something, we will have to share. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I'm really excited to see where that goes. Adamika. Yeah, so I'm going to do the arc on the ACA. So I think one thing is just um, watching the ACA in some ways crumble mm -hmm. um, has been a little challenging part of the, the year. Um, and so many of the things that people in this community have spent years advocating for, um, they've kind of, you know, it's kind of gone away. Um, but I would say that there are bright spots in, in, in the midst of despair in some ways. And one area where you've seen a tremendous amount of federal focus um, was around kidney care this year um, in an in a, um, amazing way. And so I think that, um, which certainly benefited many of the people in, and certainly in digital health um, pretty well. So I would say that the, the collaboration and the communication around advocacy um, as it hits CMMI and what hits HHS and CMS. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes you do get great wins, and that's a good example of one. Um, I would say a lot of circling around AI. I think that there's a, a lot of interest um, around, in a good way, right? Like making sure that AI is thoughtful and that um, there are public private mm -hmm. partnerships, and, you know, how do we include communities to be a part of. Um, creating AI products, um, I would say those are really positive things that we've been seeing. Absolutely. Policy side. 
And I'm going to weave in some audience questions throughout. Yeah. Um, so one question that we are getting is, in healthcare, do you think there's too much regulation or too little? Um, who wants to take the first stab at that? <laughs> uh, uh, well, I'll <laughs> jump in. Um, I think that the, uh, the regulation of an industry at a local level, state level, and federal level um, makes the kind of diffusion of innovation very challenging. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I could have very well said, you know, is a, a very important uh, issue of, uh, of policy is how localities regulate behavioral health televisits mm -hmm. um, because it's regulated on a local level. Um, I think licensure uh, and scope of licensure on a state level. Um, it, it's, I, I mean, it, I wouldn't say it's too much, too little. I think it's illogical uh, and the extent to which we could have some more coordination I think um, would make me feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, it's an interesting time, right? Because I think that our politics are influencing our policies in ways that I don't know are necessarily always logical. Um, and so it's a, it's a time unlike anything I've seen, at least in my life cycle of you know, several decades of being in healthcare. Um, I've seen the good, bad, and the ugly to regulation, right? I was a hospital administrator for 15 years. And so uh, there's, you know, the kind of the annoyance of, you know, some of the regulations. But yet, if your family member is going in or you're having a baby at the facility, you're really glad that they're there. Um, I think the challenge now is just uh, there's a tremendous amount of noise Definitely. and um, really not a clear roadmap uh, of understanding of um, kind of what is happening as far as regulation goes. Mm -hmm. like, it doesn't seem to be good coordination between the heads of um, all of the areas that tend to regulate mm -hmm. thoughtfully yeah. um, across this country. Jared? Yeah, so for my point, you know, when you sort of step back philosophically and look at that question of, so what's the function of regulation? I often like to say if the FDA didn't exist, we would have to create it. Yeah. Um, me, and what I mean by that is that there's just so much in medicine today that it's, it would be impossible for any one physician or group of physicians to learn everything they would need to know about everything that's going on. So there has to be some actor in society whose job is to say that you know, we look at this. Um, the question of you know too much or too little, uh, at least sort of from the health tech and biotech side of things, I, I think my answer would be um, maybe the absolute level is fine. How it's being applied is not that great in a lot of uh, where the focus is. Um, specifically, you know. It, any time that a company has to jump through hoops and do a lot of busy work, where you're essentially uh, doing the same sorts of things, but they're variations on a the theme because the regulators in one jurisdiction said, eh, I want to do it slightly differently here and slightly differently there, you know, getting back to your point about you know, state versus local. Um, that always seems to be not that great of a use of time uh, by anyone. Thankfully, this is something that at FDA, they're moving more and more on both the drug and device side toward can we do single, uh, can we collaborate on regulations across, uh, across nationalities, but then also if you're approved in one jurisdiction, yeah. does that count everywhere else? Mm -hmm. you know, can we have sort of like a single regulatory body for, um, uh, or at least standards that we all agree on? So that would be one way where I think that uh, you know, we really could uh, improve. Um, the second thing, it, there's always a, a tension between innovators and regulators, where innovators are almost getting ahead of how regulators can respond. Mm -hmm. And because we're talking about medicine here, it's in everyone's interest, everyone is motivated by saying like, okay, what can we do to get these, you know, these treatments and these cures out to the public faster? 
Um, and so that's one thing where I think we could be doing a better job, although um, in, in terms of catching up, the last two years have been just, uh, I think, amazing um, from the perspective of FDA. I hope that continues where they're looking at kind of what's coming down from, from innovators and saying, OK, how do we react that so that we are not the bottleneck? Um, it's been really refreshing to see that. I hope that trend continues. And to stay on that topic for, for just a minute, who benefits from FDA pre-cert? What type of company? Uh, for pre-cert specifically? Mm -hmm. So it's really going to be, once they iron everything out, anyone making software at all, regulated software, period. The entire goal of it is to, while still maintaining regulation, allow regulated software manufacturers to move with a little bit more of the agility that you know, Apple, Microsoft, insert software company here would be able to move in. So in a way, we all benefit once things have, have been ironed out. Um, they're still admittedly very much in the we're, we're figuring it out phase. They're going to have to go to Congress for more statutory authority to really implement it. So, you know, in terms of your question is, you know, hey, Jared, right now in the 18 months, next 18 months, am I going to benefit? Should my company consider it? Um, I think you have to ask, you know, do you have the resources to really help FDA co-develop it, be a partner with them? Mm -hmm. um, whereas for a larger organization or one with, a, you know, a startup with a lot of capital, maybe that's true. Um, for a, you know, 10-person software startup out of UCSF or Stanford or something like that, I generally think not. Yeah. So we're getting uh, a lot of questions around how health tech community and startups in general um, can become more policy literate. Mm. What are your thoughts there? Tom, do you want to take this one? Um, a start is by focusing on the problems that our um, kind of core safety net are facing. Um, and by that, I mean Medicare and Medicaid, and actually looking at the problems um, that are uh, that are driving um, excess excess spend. Um, I think there is, uh, in my experience, um, a much greater uh, uh, willingness is not the word, but no openness um, at the state level with uh, Medicaid programs um, to. In, initiate pilots um, that then scale quickly if they work. Um, I would say when you're moving toward things like CMMI, uh, I'd <laughs> like to now. say that they scale, uh, um, but uh, they don't. Um, I, I, th I think sometimes we, um, we create problems that we want to solve that are not tied to the regulatory community uh, and then expect them to find Jesus. And <laughs> that's not going to happen. Um, so finding that connection. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I'd want to step back a little bit on this question. So part of the, the challenge sometimes is, is working in a bubble, mm -hmm. right? If you don't have a community in which you can start to ask questions about, hey, you know, how did you address this state in Medicaid, or um, what, you know, how, how did you how did you get past this particular regulation or issue? Um, I think in Health Tech for Medicaid specifically, we have um, a group of more than fifty plus um, health tech companies who've come together. And part of that is not to have one policy voice, because um, we're not a trade association or any of that nature. And we certainly have other stakeholders besides entrepreneurs. Um, but to really have a community where you can start to ask those questions. You have everything from um, you know, startups have consultants they use, right? Um, to you know, many startups that, that are large enough have staff. Right? And so how can we leverage those resources appropriately? And that's one of the things we're really 
talking a lot about. Like, if 17 of these startups are actually using the same consulting company, does it make sense for us to, I know we're gonna have questions after this, my phone will be blowing up. <laughs> but like, does it make sense for us to, to do this on a scalable nature, right? Is there economies of scale where we can actually kind of work collaboratively? Because the policies shift and they change to pace on if you're talking to MCOs, uh, Medicaid MCOs, if you're talking to states that do procurement directly, if it's, um, so, and I think it is a sea of, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a murky sea to try to figure out on your own. So I think it gets back to exactly what you mentioned. Try to understand what your pain points are and then figuring out how is it that um, a community of people can help you. So if it's, you need a connection to a state Medicaid director, that might be really easy to do, like pick up a phone and, and call, right? And especially if somebody has a relationship with them. But so much of healthcare is relational, right? It's um, who you know and how you know them. Um, that I think having a community is, is, is a good way to start to have uh, policy shifts um, for innovators. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, Adamika, staying on you for, for just a second. So um, there is an introduction of new CPT, CPT codes for telehealth and remote patient monitoring. Sure. Um, where do you see the pockets of innovation are there? Um, especially if you think about your niche. Um, I was telling Adamika that I was on her Twitter account last night and um, <laughs> she's been known as the Madam of Medicaid. Um, so <laughs> what, in your niche, do you see that these new CPT codes, the new physician uh, fee schedule, um, driving innovation? So let me step back and talk about Madam Medicaid. That's only because my <laughs> friends were so tired of me talking about Medicaid for the last 20 years. They're like, you can turn any you know, cocktail conversation into <laughs> Medicaid conversation. <laughs> so that's not due to my knowledge of CPT codes. Um, uh, <laughs> what I will say, though, is there's an opportunity there for collaboration. Okay. And I think it's for whatever reason, we forget that there's an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Like to me, there's a Medicaid ecosystem and we've got to be invested in that ecosystem for policies to shift and change and for us to understand what those policies are. So oftentimes there are levers that, are, that each stakeholder has. And if you understand what those levers are, so those CPT codes, that movement came out of providers, right? Really working very hard. And so how is it that, you know, innovators and entrepreneurs can work with the provider community to best understand the nexus of where those came from. Because what I've seen is a lot of entrepreneurial companies take a different stab at it. They look at it as face value and then walk down a path and spend months down this path. And that's actually not where it came from. The advocacy came from the other side. Yeah. You know, so how is it that we could work collaboratively as a community and say, you know, we're really interested, you know, we're a group of, of um, companies and we believe this telehealth, you know, work is going to impact us. You know, ask the American Medical Association, ask America Essential Hospitals, how can we come together and make sure, oh, wait, this didn't come from the physicians, this came from the nurses, right? Like, understand the nexus of where that policy came from and the levers associated with that policy to better figure out whether or not it's a piece like your business can thrive in that environment. Because oftentimes there are people that jump onto policies and then they jump right back off because they realize it's, it's counterproductive to their business yeah, model. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, um, I would double down on that. I think, uh, for example, uh, the RPM, so, uh, sorry, remote patient monitoring. <laughs> um, I now work for a defense contractor, so I uh, speak only in acronyms. acronyms. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, the, uh, you know, right now, I think that a, um, it is, we've got CP, CPT codes for it. Um, my bet is if you waited for physicians to use those CPT codes, um, we'd be talking about innovations in this four years from now. Mm -hmm. um, this is gonna be done largely by nurses and it is going to require and opens an opportunity for a turnkey solution around um, both the technology and the reimbursement yeah. um, and, and the coding accuracy for that. Uh, the same is true, I, I would argue, for supplemental benefits in uh, Medicare Advantage. 
um, you know, having worked with a number of plans, um, their uh, timeline for when they started working on those benefits was when those benefits started kicking in. Um, so you're going to see a lot of innovation, I think, in 2020 yeah. and beyond there. Uh, and that's, uh, that's fantastic because, you know, People, uh, people are people 99.9% .9 of the time, and patients, uh, the rest, it, it might be nice to go to where they are. And I mean, I think that that speaks to the alphabet soup of how healthcare is done, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding CPT codes means you don't understand the ICD-10s, right? And then understanding that junk in is junk out. Yep. So I mean, it goes back to that earlier comment around, you know, if, if you don't have your coding appropriately or correct, right, that's also going to adversely potentially impact yeah, things, things, for sure. I'm curious about, um, you know, 21st century cures information blocking, right? Um, this is a huge issue that policy is trying to solve. Um, how can new and even existing uh, digital health companies ensure that information is accessible from the start, from the get? Do you want to take that one, Jared? Sure. You're talking about the sort of interoperability aspect of, yes. of companies? Yeah. Um, so I don't know a single company that we've spoken to or that you know, we, we work with where this isn't um, a, a desire, either that they're hearing that from the, from the clinical community of you know, absolutely this must talk to the, uh, you know, our EHR period, otherwise it's, you know, we're, it's not gonna be a starter. So I don't think that that's a, you know, from, the, from the technologist side, there's a willingness. It's just that they, the, the, the minefields that they have to navigate um, are many and legion and kind of hard to figure out. Um, the thing that, you know, that we advise, again, because we kind of look through everything through the lens of okay, how is this going to impact you getting through FDA and on the market ultimately, is that you need, there's a tension and a balance between a desire for interoperability while managing the cybersecurity concerns that are top of mind for everyone and will be increasingly so. Um, and FDA is going to expect you to, to, to think of that too, like, okay, great, you have all these features and all these interfaces in and out of your product and data is moving six ways to Sunday. Fantastic, we love it. Um, but then how are you thinking about the risks that, it, that impose? What are your controls against those risks? Um, how do you think about the trade-off? What are the worst case scenarios? These are all the things that you know, companies need to take into account um, as they're thinking through their interoperability. Yeah. Tom? Um, you know, so the optimist in me uh, sees programs like My Healthy Data uh, as absolutely moving in the direction of um, uh, you know, arming uh, myself uh, and everyone in this room with uh, information uh, that can be valuable to our caregivers, um, especially if we can uh, find some uh, nifty uh, entrepreneurs who can explain to us the gobbledygook that is hard for our providers uh, to understand. Um, the pessimist in me is the um, Augustine-like response from all of the uh, associations around providers and technology companies to, uh, 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 to Tefka, um, which was, you know, Lord, give us interoperability, but not too soon. <laughs> uh, you know, th there is a concern that I have that, um, uh, we, we're not taking, um, taking this seriously enough and that um, if the federal government actually follows through on uh, a, a number of uh, uh, pieces of the proposed rules, um, people are going to be chasing. Yeah. And yeah. that is going to create, um, I think, some, some legal and regulatory challenges. Yeah, I mean, I want to step even further back and make sure that we don't forget about populations. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and I say that because oftentimes people think only of the rainbow of health, right? The employer-based coverage, the, the private insurance market. There's a whole other part of that, what I call a circle of health, right? There are lots of populations um, who have not still even adjusted well to like computers being in the exam rooms yeah. if they indeed get care, right? And so I think that we have to think about how data has been used, how data has been disseminated in certain communities in this country and certainly vulnerable populations. And, and how, how do we make sure that the voices of the voiceless are not lost in the gobbledygook of no. the like higher level sets of re regulations, right? Because none of the associations speak on behalf of communities, right? So how and, does a startup build a, um, you know, how do they build with the Medicaid community in mind? How do they innovate? Yeah, and I, you know, Medicaid is a big population, right? And I would say, you know, my focus personally and professionally on Medicaid has really been, I felt like firsthand I saw that if you can improve the care of 76 million people, or 75 million now, you can improve the care for everyone, right? It's such a large population of people in this country. Um, you know, I think it starts with really understanding who you're trying to serve and being really authentic. Um, digital health you know, shouldn't be just for certain populations. Health, the, the definition of what health is, it, it, you know, it, it shouldn't be just for certain people. Mm -hmm. So I sometimes just step back and people, because people ask me all this question all the time, right? Um, vulnerable populations are more than just you know, poverty. I mean, like, if you know what the Medicaid program is, yes, it's a state and federal um, you know, collaboration but it's people who are blind, people who are disabled, people who have sick children. You know, I mean, it, it encompasses much more than just poverty. And I think we could all benefit from a little bit of understanding of taking whatever product you have and making sure that a larger subset of the health of this nation exactly. um, gets to experience the good from your app or from you know your software or whatever and and really involving them in the process they're you know in california it's really not i mean there's 14 million people in california so one in three californians are on medicaid um one in five americans are on medicaid right so uh i think it's just we have to reframe our, our thought process if we're here to disrupt health care let's let's disrupt it in the right way in keeping the consumer in mind, there's a question from the audience that, you know, the financial services industry has the Consumer Protection Bureau. Um, do we need something like that in healthcare? Something that is focused on the, the needs and the interests of the consumer? Or do we already have it? Depends on who you ask. <laughs> but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Tom? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'll have a sh short answer because I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> um, I th think that there need, there is going to be a product market fit for um, helping people to understand what um, disease-specific applications um, are really um, really addressing for them um, and uh, the difference between, oh, well, I have, uh, you know, pulmonary hypertension or cardiometabolic syndrome, so I've got six apps and <laughs> six health coaches who are telling me var various things. Um, I think there probably needs to be some protection there, but um, yeah. it's not exactly um, uh, overdraft uh, rules. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would say for, for my part, it would come down to what authority and like, you know, what's the goal of this kind okay. of organization, you know? Mm. Um, I, I, I think if you, if you pulled um, the, you know, the mass of America and said, you know, how, how could your healthcare be better? Um, one of the top 
10, if not top five things for pretty much everyone would be a better understanding of why things cost the way they cost. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, can I go to my doctor and know exactly what I'm on the hook for? Or God forbid, I'm in an accident, someone I love is in an accident, you know, how am I going to know we're not going to be on the hook fighting the insurance company for some like $200,000 bill because mm -hmm. we have an ER stay and an emergency surgery and all the rest of it. So if the mandate is, is if, if we would need some sort of super agency to untangle the mess that is uh, payment for healthcare in this country to do so, I could see a credible argument for it. But uh, again, it kind of comes down to what authority would this thing have? What would be the goal and such? Because there's, there's so many you know, huge interconnected uh, problems in, in healthcare right now that the last thing we need is just some other super agency that's gonna write rules that people have to comply with that don't actually have this sort of tangible benefit to the patient. <clears throat> Is well, there, you say, should get on the uh, thing, Democratic uh, debate stage and <laughs> explain I mean, I, that. I wish people. Elizabeth Warren would I mean, say. Like, the reality is we do this. have one thing, right? We have data. Mm -hmm. And our data isn't that great. Our data tells us that our US health system has major health inequalities. And if we can start to address some of that, um, you know, that's a step in the right direction. Because irrespective of whatever bot or human or state agency or federal uh, we can't keep ignoring the fact that healthcare is very different yeah. depending on what slice of the population you live in. And sometimes it has, it has zero to do with socioeconomics. Sometimes it has just to do with phenotypic characteristics. Mm -hmm. Other times it has something to do with you know, the city you live in and the zip code you have. Um, and I think, you know, hearkening back to social determinants of health and all of the things we're trying to, to come together around, I think we would have to really focus on health equity. So what startups in your you know, realm are doing that in an innovative way? I would say that, I mean, well, I represent a lot of uh, different stakeholders and interests. I would say that Health Tech for Medicaid specifically um, really has an, an effort to, one, improve the Medicaid program and two, to deal with the health equity issues. Mm -hmm. So it's always going to be a part of the conversation that we have to have, just due to the nature of the people that we are focused on serving, which ultimately will serve everyone in this country. You know, uh, CMS and ONC and FDA are really open to engaging <laughs> with companies, with healthcare organizations, with startups. How can startups get involved? Um, where should they start if they're trying to navigate? This, the public policy? How do they get their voice heard? Um, you know, I think two things. One, um, uh, there, there are, uh, inside of these agencies, um, people who are as entrepreneurial and, uh, and innovation-minded. Sometimes they have a title that even has the word innovation in it. Um, so, uh, you know, getting, getting serious about your interactions there. I would also say, um, you know, suck up your humility and go to the Congress uh, people uh, who are on the relevant subcommittees and talk to the health LA who is 25 years younger than you are and, um, and, and ask uh, for really what are you looking for from, if it's the FDA, uh, to hear from them because we're, we're, we're engaging. Um, and, and that can be awkward sometimes, um, but uh, it's, it's really kind of feet on the ground. Well, and then, and then share that information, right? Because we're in the age of technology, right? You don't then need to keep that to yourself. Because how is it that we can change this? We can change it by, I don't think that everyone has a federal register at their bedside, right? Table at night, right? It's complicated. It's difficult to understand. But how can we leverage resources together to make sure that everyone understands the gobbledygook, or at least some of the acronyms, and at least a landscape of the language? Um, and we could do a better job of that, admittedly. 
Now we have a couple minutes left. I want to take some more audience questions. Um, and, and, and this is one that um, I think is very prevalent right now. Um, could the opioid epidemic been halted or stalled or slowed down if there was some sort of policy in place? Hmm. Uh, There's the dangerous answer of maybe we shouldn't have changed the guidelines for opioid um, uh, uh, prescription. prescription yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we created kind of this problem. I mean, I'll just say I was a hospital administrator. I ran the pain service actually at UCSF. <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, we created this problem. We put this on the front of Time magazine. Chronic pain is a major issue. Go and get drugs. We allowed kind of this issue to, to, to be um, what it is. And this is not the first lesson. Like, we have hundreds of these lessons as a country. So I think that it's how do we learn from these lessons, right? It's a significant challenge. In many ways, we're fighting a little bit of this lesson with some other substances right now, right? And 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 it never shall we want to talk about that, depending on what state you're in. But um, I think, how do we overcome when we make mistakes, and how do we address, like, honestly, what the history is? And we don't have enough time today, right? But but I think I think it's really coming clean with what what we did as a nation and saying, we're better than this, and this is what we're doing to fix and correct it. And I think you know, Jerome, Jerome Adams, who's our Surgeon General, has a really personal and amazing story around this. Like It's something that you know, has impacted his own personal family. He's a brother who's in prison, right, basically, and is fighting for the opioid epidemic daily. So any other thoughts? Yeah, I would, I would just have to second the point about the, the, the wild swings in, in the, the guidance and, and, and prescriptions of you know, prescription opioids, I think, is at the root of it. I mean, ultimately, my view of this problem is it was you know, an overreaction, at least the, 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 change in, the change in prescribing guidelines was an overreaction to the bad actors in the system and drove a lot of people out of the legitimate uh, clinic or hospital and onto the streets, yeah. um, which is when this thing you know, really, really took off. In terms of, I, unfortunately, in terms of the, the, you know, how do you find and track those bad actors? I think that's a really difficult question that we could talk about for hours, but don't have time for in a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. So they'd probably switch us out for different <laughs> panelists too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just time for one question. This says I'm out of time, but I think we have about a couple more minutes. Um, so what is one specific policy challenge that you've spent the most time on in your work advocating for? And I'd like to start with that, Amika. Yeah, I would say that um, making sure that voices of the underserved, of the underrepresented, of um, populations that typically don't have a voice in this country to be a part of the system. Mm -hmm. Tom? Um. I'll go full broken record on this. Um, I think medical benefits without uh, social services are uh, incomplete. So the continuation of, uh, uh, of expansion for um, uh, supplemental benefits is something that I hope goes far and, fa far and fast. So I would say, in general, um, allowing the benefits of software development to really be realized inside of a of a you know a health tech or a biotech context. I've been doing that you know far before Enzyme, and we'll probably keep doing it for the next ten years. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. I think you're out of time. Thank you. Thank you.